This is Film Talk, where we interview the brightest minds in filmmaking five days a week. Do you need a great camera for your next shoot? You may want to consider the world's lightest handheld Super 35 digital film camera, Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4.6K. The Ursa Mini boasts a 4.6K sensor, global shutter, and up to 15 stops of dynamic range. It's perfectly balanced for handheld use and comfortable enough to be used all day long. Scene one, take one. Film Talk Nation, we are greenlit for yet another great show. Vanessa Frank here, and I'm excited to bring you our featured guest today, John Shepard. John, are you ready for your close-up? I'm ready. Thanks, Great. Vanessa. Great. John is founder and president of Empower Pictures. He manages the development, financing, and production of the company Slate. John has produced over 20 independent features, been the showrunner of a critically acclaimed web series, and served as an executive at DreamWorks. Proud to co-founding Empower Pictures, John produced such award-winning films as The Ultimate Gift and Bobby Jones' Stroke of Genius. And with Empower Pictures, John has produced a critically acclaimed body of work, including Toronto Film Festival nominated The Stoning of Sarah M, starring Jim Caviezel, as well as the upcoming Shia LaBeouf movie Man Down, which, which co-stars Kate Mara and Gary Oldman. Additionally, Empower's past releases include Golden Globe nominated Machine Gun Preacher with Gerard Butler and Toronto Film Festival winner Bella. John, it is an honor to have you on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So, John, I would love to go back to your roots to start with and learn a little bit about how you first got into the industry. So how did you get your start? Sure. You know, my uh, start was very young when I was uh, just in middle school. I used to see uh, these Disney movies with this kid. I think it was Johnny Whitaker or one of these guys. And I just thought, how did that kid get to do that role? How did he get to be on TV? I want to be on TV. And I just very early on had it in my mind, not that I wanted to, but I was going to do that. It was almost a belief and a confidence, not a, in a you know, uh, presumptuous or uh, in a precocious way. It was just kind of this conviction I had that I'm going to do this. And so I set out to kind of find out how do you become an actor? And was luck would have it, there was a auditions for a play in my hometown called Ten Weeks with the Cir Circus or, or Toby Tyler. And I'd just seen the Disney movie called Toby Tyler. And I thought, I'm going to get that role. Not in, again, a cocky way or an arrogant way. I just, I'm going to go, I'm going to be Toby Tyler. And I got cast. And for me, that was just a sign. This is what I'm supposed to do. So I had a long, checkered career as an actor before I transitioned into uh, producing. And at what point did you make that transition into producing? Well, you know, when you get tired of eating tuna fish out of a can and being wealthy one day and dirt poor the next, and then you decide you want to have a relationship and have some stability and provide for uh, your wife, uh, you start looking at, well, how do I make a business out of this show, um, this show business? And, um, you know, the, the, what my wife and I decided was let's give it five years, and if I don't become the next Leonardo DiCaprio or or Robert Redford in those days, um, then I'll tr try and transition to something a little more stable. And although I had a very, I, th I think, you know, considering the amount of, of actors and the success level, I was in top one or two percent of, of working actors in terms of my my career. It just wasn't uh, stable enough for for us wanting to have a family and buy a house. And so I fell into actually producing. I had never really strove to be a producer. I had worked for a film company that said, we're not going to make movies anymore. They're just too expensive. And we don't know people in Hollywood that want to work at scale to make family films. And of course, I said, I know, I, I know nothing but guys that want to work in good projects that are uh, redemptive and uplifting. And if I could do a film, would you let me produce it? If I could get it done for a number of days, I said, well, what do you need? And I said, well, and I just made it up. I had no idea what it cost to produce a movie, but I said, I need a half million dollars. And through a series of writing a script and preparing a budget and learning as much as I could from a fraternity brother who knew how to produce, we pitched and sold our first film and ended up going to film camp where we all uh, learned to make a movie together. And uh, it turned out well, and they let us do a second one and a fourth one and an eighth one. I ended up doing 15 films for that company. John, that is amazing. You know, I think that so many people in this industry um, that have, you know, reached a point of success like you have, have oftentimes been those people who've kind of said, you know, I don't necessarily know how to do this. I've not necessarily gone to school for this, but I'm just going to take this opportunity and figure it out. And I think that that's a particularly inspiring story for people who are trying to figure out how they can, 
you know, how they can uh, make some forward progress as a producer. Um, sure. So for, you know, for a lot of us, there's definitely, you know, those those uh, those times that we just feel really stuck in our career and where for whatever reason, it just seems like every, you know, everyone's passing and everyone's saying no to us. What is the biggest challenge that you've encountered so far in your career and how did you turn that situation around? Well, I think the like all of us in life in general, sometimes what looks to be the worst disaster, the biggest setback, your your biggest weakness, your biggest failing, can launch you into your greatest success if you if you realize that life is not a game of perfect. You know, golf is not a game of perfect; it's a game of recovery. So you have to keep a very positive mindset and realize this is a business that's and a town that's really designed to. to to drag people down, to beat them up, to shatter dreams. It's it's not the land where dreams are made. It's where 99% of dreams are broken. But if you can go into it and realize my identity, my self-worth, my sense of purpose is not dependent upon what I do, but it's really who I am, my character, my relationships, my friends, what I love to do. And that I got into this business of acting because I just thought it was fun. I didn't know they'd pay me to do it. I just loved doing it. So when I had my biggest setback, which was, uh, gosh, I don't know, a dozen or 15 years ago now, um, we all got fired from a movie. Me and all my friends were down on an island off the coast of Florida making a film for a client, and a client decided they changed their mind. They, they didn't like us. They didn't like the script. They didn't like the movie we were about to make, and so they fired us all. And it was a devastating moment when your identity is caught up in what you do. And for me, I was a film producer, and I was a successful film producer, and I was making a movie, and I told everybody, and suddenly we were out of a job. And it was humiliating. It was devastating. It was humbling. Um, and it was, you know, oh, my gosh, my life is not the perfect career path I thought. I could have wallowed in self-pity and defeat, and, and uh, except for the fact that I got on a plane – to head back from my firing and the plane had engine trouble. <laughs> so I'm flying back to tell the crew we've all been let go and give them the worst news. And suddenly the pilot is saying, uh, we don't want you to panic, but one of our two engines has just gone out and um, you need to remain calm and in your seats. Uh, we're perfectly trained on how to fly an airplane on just one uh, engine, which of course panicked all of us. <laughs> but I realized at that moment it put life in perspective. You know, movies, it's just a movie, as they say. It's just a movie. And I've just been fired. So what? I want to see my family. My life is not about what I do. It's about who I am. It's about my body of work. It's not about this one job. It's not about this one setback. And suddenly as we are coming down and the plane is shaking, you know, this is at O'Hare, you're just, you find yourself praying. And I was just praying, you know, God, I don't care if I never make another movie in my life. I don't care if I never get to act again. I just want to see my family. I just want to be home safely. And suddenly all your priorities get realigned. And I, um, of course, landed safely. And But it was during that moment that I realized, you know, do I really trust God with my career, with my life, with being fired? Do I really trust him or is it just talk? Do I really trust that this is what I'm supposed to be doing? Do I really trust my gut that, that I've made the right decision in, in, in this case, even though it resulted in us getting fired. And I realized, yeah, I, I do. And, and whether or not I ever work again, it's okay. I'll be okay. And out of that came a positive attitude that it's kind of like going over Niagara Falls. Um, you know, once you've gone over, <laughs> it's not as scary anymore. So what's the worst thing you can imagine has happened to you? Um, suddenly littler things don't bother you so much. You know, if you've been in, in war and looked down the barrel of an AK-47, suddenly you go back to the entertainment industry and get fired or somebody doesn't like your script or like the way you look, it doesn't hurt so much because you've encountered bigger things and lived for bigger causes than just movies and being famous. So that was like my big turning point was realizing, you know what, this isn't all of who I am. It isn't all of what life is about. And out of that, out of those ashes actually came – a great victory and an amazing change to my career. I think uh, I, I really like what you were saying that um, it's not, you know, Hollywood is not a town in which dreams are made. It's a dream. It's a town in which 
dreams are broken and uh, definitely that's something that I've very much seen through uh, through my career and through the careers of, of a number of, of friends and esteemed colleagues and um, I think you make a very important point that if somebody is serious about their career and being able to sustain their career over a number of years you have to find that inner fortitude that inner um, that inner resilience to where you're not going to get so hung up on a single project that you know if you get a pass on that project or you know the movie doesn't get made or the movie doesn't get distributed that that's going to take you out of the game um so I, I really appreciate you sharing that story i think it's something that a lot of us can relate to um john what is one thing that you really wish you'd known earlier in your career i guess one thing i wish i'd known earlier in my career is um how important relationships are we we just take it for granted uh, how uh, you, you think I, if I go to school or if I'm good looking or if I'm um, super talented or or but, you know, it's it used to be for me. No, no, I I, I want to earn it on my own. It's not who you know, it's what you know. And what I learned and throughout this process and what I wish I'd learned right away was it is who, you know, this business, you have to be good. You have to be good looking. You have to be talented. You do have to go to school. You're competing against all these other young people. Um, that have done all those things. But the difference is really relationship. And this is a business like any business, like life itself, about relationship. And people hire people that they like, they want to be around, they want to be in relationship with. And I, I thought, oh, I don't want to call in any of my favors or or impose upon anybody's um, you know goodwill by hitting them up for a job. And you know what? This whole business is about hitting somebody up you know for a job, asking for help, reaching out, and also, more importantly, helping others. Once you get to a point, taking a chance on somebody else. And I believe anybody that works hard enough and stays at it long enough, you will get an opportunity. So the question is, what will you do when that opportunity comes your way? Will you be prepared? Will you be ready? And I, through the good, the good fortune of have gone, having gone to Northwestern my freshman year and back in Chicago, met a famous film director who was an alum named Gary Marshall. And he'd said, any young people ever come out to Los Angeles, look me up. Um, and I got to Los Angeles and I went to a taping of one of his TV shows. I think it was Happy Days. And I saw him from the studio audience and I yelled out, hey, Mr. Marshall. And he looked up and I ran down to the, as close as you could get to the set and said, I'm out here from Northwestern. He said to look you up. If I ever got here, here I am. And he gave me his card and he said, call my casting director on Monday morning and tell him Gary Marshall said for you to call. And you would have thought the red carpet had been rolled out for the next rock star in Hollywood. I mean, I got the full royal treatment at Paramount Pictures, thanks to Gary Marshall. And I realized this is a business where people want to help you if you've earned the opportunity. And you do have to earn it. You do have to work hard. It's not a luck thing. You, you have to make your luck by studying, by preparing, by being ready, by doing all the things you can so when that opportunity comes, you are able to seize it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a phone call from a friend, a relative. My dad's a famous director. Uh, somebody in my acting class told me about this audition. I can't tell you how many times I've gone on just wild goose chases that turned out to be nothing but just through a friend seeing me at a restaurant or a church or in a play saying, hey, you ought to be in this. I've got this role for you. And, and, and something just came my way. I wasn't even looking for it, but I was out there doing the work anyway, doing the work. And then people take a chance. And then you, I have to return that favor and do the same for somebody else. Well, in that vein, John, maybe you can tell us whether there are specific daily practices that contribute to your personal success. It sounds like um, those personal relationships are a very important part of your strategy and your holistic uh, work ethos. Um, so do you maybe have some 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 um, some practices that you that you can point to that are part of just making sure that those relationships continue to be built? Sure. Well, I've, I've always had a, um, a very, uh, I love acting. So for me, it isn't work to every day study, to be in class, to be working on a scene. So when I was acting, it was all about doing the work. So that meant going to class. It meant working out. I think you have to have a healthy mind. You have to have a healthy body. You have to have a health, healthy spirit. You want to be in balance. People can pick up when you walk into a room, whether you're pitching a movie for financing or whether you're pitching yourself as an actor, they pick up on and can smell fear or desperation 
or, or just a, ooh, an uncomfortable, awkward hunger about you. So you need to be in a place where you're very confident, you're very centered, you're very, you're very much in balance. And that comes through working hard uh, physically. So I go to the gym every day. Um, emotionally, I am studying. I am basically doing my acting classes, and uh, and also artistically, you know, I am uh, working on my craft. So I'm going to watch films. I'm going to watch plays. I'm going to work with other actors, doing some interesting um, opportunity, making some interesting opportunities for us to whether it be in a showcase or stage a play or just do a scene or or shoot a short film. We're always working at our craft. Um, I also make it a habit to be in a, a small group. So for me, uh, being a Christian, my background, I would meet uh, once a week with a bunch of like-minded actors for breakfast. And we'd usually get there around 7 to like 8, 8.30, and we would talk about our days and our auditions and what's going on with the agents and what kind of roles we're up for. And we would really wrestle through some of these issues, and we would encourage one another. We'd also share wisdom with one another, and we'd also pray for one another. So whatever you can do to make this town or any career or job smaller by getting into a, a group of like-minded fans – that are for you, you know, um, that's what you want. You want a group of people that will surround you and encourage you, not a bunch of people. It's a very depressing and can be a very discouraging town. So you want to um, surround yourself with people that encourage you, that you draw strength from, that you can also encourage. And by the way, a lo- so many actors become self-obsessed, self-consumed, and producers as well. The more that you can focus outside of yourself on others and helping others – and be about something besides yourself, the more freedom you start to have as an actor. You're not so self-conscious. You're not so inward. You're outward focused. And people pick up on that when you come into a room. Man, there's a confidence about this guy, a boldness about this guy. I like this guy. I want to be around this guy. And by the way, he doesn't seem to be all about me, you know, which is the theme song of the, the Screen Actors Guild is all about me. Life is all about me. All about me, not about you. You know, it's that, that people don't want that sort of um, attitude, that sort of personality, that sort of arrogance, unless you're at the very, very top of your profession and game, right? And even then, it's hard for them to stomach. (laughs) John, I think you make a very important point. Um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have been indoctrinated in this false precept that, you know, if you want to have success, you have to um, just be very aggressive in the sense of, um, you know, not making friends and, and seeing someone else's gain as your loss. And in my experience, I would really concur with you that the people who are the most successful are often those that are the most generous, who see um, their peers not as their competitors, but the, as their friends. And I think that having that kind of generosity of spirit definitely makes a difference between being successful and oftentimes not so successful. So I really appreciate you bringing up what I believe is a very important point. Um, It sounds like you're someone who has an incredibly strong work ethos, but nonetheless, I still want to ask you this question. Um, Are there any shortcuts or hacks that you can recommend for listeners in your line of work? So maybe other producers, other actors, um, are there any of these kind of, um, you know, shortcuts, so to speak, that you found to be particularly helpful? Well, um, as an actor, I think the shortcuts, the hacks are to get involved in classes at UCLA, USC, AFI, any kind of a large university that's near you where the next wave of super talented filmmakers and film directors and theater directors are coming out of. You want to get involved, not with a first year student or a freshman. You want to get involved with a graduate second year student's short film or graduate second year student's theater project and audition and hang out and get to know these. These are the filmmakers that the studios, the agencies have their eyes on. These are the people you want to befriend if you're in school. Because guess what? This is your peer group that they're going to carry you uh, and you're going to carry them into their career. And I'm still friends today, 25, 30 years ago, with buddies I went to Northwestern and UCLA with, and we all help each other. It's an incredibly tight-knit community because we went through battle together. We stayed in touch, and this, again, comes down 
to relationship. Um, I think it helps to be in a major city like Los Angeles or New York or Dallas, but it also can be very beneficial to be a big fish in a small pond. So my success was I grew up in a little tiny suburb of Chicago, but I became the big fish in that local community theater and then doing dinner theater. So when I came to Los Angeles, suddenly, oh, you've got to meet this guy. He's only here for two weeks. He's from Chicago, and he's done a ton of stuff in Chicago. So now, there are probably more talented, better-looking, more experienced kids out here in Los Angeles than me, but they were all here in Los Angeles. So there was 10,000 of them. There was only one of me coming from Chicago. So you've got to find a way to make yourself unique, distinctive, stand out without you know, being awkward and making people feel uncomfortable. But you have to find a way to differentiate yourself and distinguish yourself from the crowd. That may mean making your own movie or funding your own um, theatrical production, stage play, doing a, you, you've got to get out there and actors act, writers write, producers produce. You can't wait for somebody to give you the opportunity. You have to be a taker. And I don't mean that in the worst sense. I think too many of us are givers where we give up, we give away, we, you know, give out. And what we need to do is take root and immerse yourself in the, in the craft you need to take um, rest and realize it ain't all on you. You can only do so much, and at, at some point, some of what happens is luck. It's God. It's you being in the right place at the right time. You have to rest in that. You can't carry it around and try and make it happen. You have to know when to just use rest as a weapon. And then I think you have to take a risk at some point. Too many people play it safe. This is You get the one shot. you got to go in and knock it out of the park and punch life in the face because – Life is going to punch you many, many, many times in this career because it's a business that judges you on how you look, what you wrote, um, how you know your past success. It is all about that perception, and if you don't have thick skin and a calloused soul, it's going to be tough for you. But you don't want to become so callous and jaded and cynical that you lose that spark, that innocence, that love, that passion for what you do. That, that, that a lot of people out here have, and they walk around and people don't want to be around them. There's a sense of defeat and depression and discouragement. So that's where you have to take a risk, get out of your comfort zone, try something new, and then guess what? You eventually are going to get hit down. You need to take courage, take heart, take a chance. You need to not be discouraged by what's happening in your career and you need to not listen to those negative voices. You need to stand up for yourself and say, I can do this. It's about, again, recovery, not perfection. John, that was some great advice. I know I certainly needed to, to hear that today. I hope that, you know, every actor, every producer and director out there is taking some, uh, taking some notes on everything that you were suggesting because I think that there were some very practical uh, points. I particularly like the idea of, you know, if you're a young actor, connecting some, with some of these great directors that are coming out of UCLA, coming out of USC. Um, I know that we've seen some great filmmaking uh, come out in the pre- in in previous years from um, some excellent directors like Ryan Coogler, who, you know, it was exactly that scenario. Um, and um, so, yeah, thank you so much for sharing those uh, very erudite points. Um, well, John, we, we're about to enter our final act in which we're going to be getting some of your top recommendations. But before we do so, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. When you're putting together that masterpiece movie, the coloring is a major creative decision. It can make the difference between whether the audience interprets your story as warm, cold, dark, or light, and it can help define the genre of the film. Here's a quick tip. Horror movies tend to have blue tones. Romantic comedies tend to have warm tones. Apocalyptic movies tend to be gray and washed out. Movies in which reality is off kilter tend to have green tones. And action movies tend to feature a lot of teal and orange, particularly in their artwork. The Emmy Award winning Da Vinci Resolve from Black Magic will help you get that perfect color for your next production. The Da Vinci Resolve 12 combines professional non-linear video editing with the world's most advanced color corrector. So you can now edit, color correct, finish and deliver 
all from one system. The DaVinci Resolve is completely scalable and resolution independent, so it can be used on set, in a small studio, or integrated into the largest Hollywood production pipeline. From creative editing and multi-camera television production to high-end finishing and color correction, only DaVinci Resolve features the creative tools, compatibility, speed, and legendary image quality that you need to manage your entire workflow, which is why it is the number one solution used on Hollywood feature films. John, welcome to the final act where you'll be sharing some incredible resources and mind-blowing answers. Are you ready? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Great. John, what is the best advice you've ever received? Best advice um, I've ever received, it takes me back to a um, C.S. Lewis quote. Um, it, it, it starts like this. It says, it comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in, and so on all day, standing back from all your natural fussings and frettings coming in out of the wind. I, I love the idea of you've got to start every morning not being overwhelmed with anxiety or thinking of all the pressure, but you have to stop and rest and just, if for me it's prayer or meditation, it's getting quiet and just realizing, okay, I'm not what I do. I am who I am in my soul and my integrity and my character. And so if you start the day just being centered like that, you can carry that confidence into an acting scene, into a room where you're pitching a film, or onto a set where you're trying to make a movie. And to be a voice of calm and confidence and boldness in the midst of a, a very unstable, volatile um, career, um, that's, that's really the mark of a consummate professional. When you're, other to, when you're able to keep your head when all those around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, you know, that old Rudyard Kid, Kipling poem, If. Uh, uh, that's the best piece of advice I could give anybody is start the day quieting yourself and listening. Don't be talking, talking, talking and worrying, worrying, worrying. You've got to stop and draw strength before you go out and then start to make your way through the, the have, jungle. I'm curious, have you found that that process of kind of quietening your soul and just kind of tuning out the world, has that been something that you found yourself kind of doing on set in those moments where – you know, everything is kind of going wrong and there's lots of people around you asking, you know, kind of asking you for decisions. Has that been a practice that you have found to be helpful in those moments of crisis on set? Well, I've found just the opposite, that I've learned the hard way. You know, they say experience is a difficult teacher. She gives the uh, uh, test first and the lesson afterwards. And I have lost it on set. I have screamed. I have yelled. I've had people call me and say, my actor's getting on a plane and going back to the United States. There's nobody at the airport to meet him. And then me running down to the production office, screaming at everybody, where is the escort for the actor? We picked him up. He's in his hotel room. What? Yeah, we picked him up last night. He's in his hotel room. No, no, his agent's calling me. Oh, that must have been an old message. Or, And there's just numerous times where I've overreacted, jumped to conclusions, lost my temper, lost my goal. It has taught me I need actively to be disciplined every day to stop, take a breath. And like you said, when you get into the heat of battle, to have ice water running through your veins, to not freak out, to not flip out, to be like you know my business partner, Steve McAvity, who produced The Passion. Every day, they would get attacked when they were making The Passion of the Christ. They would get, oh, nasty articles and protests and people accusing them of all the kinds of things. And they had to make a decision, should we respond or not? And 90% of the time, they didn't respond. They did nothing. They just got quiet. And you know what? More controversy grew. And why aren't they responding? And out of that controversy, people went to see this film. I mean, what is all the fuss about? Controversy can actually be a good thing. So sometimes just being able to be cool, be calm, be collected, be quiet, be still, and know I am God is the, is the scripture from, uh, you know, that I think of. Just be still uh, and rest and wait and see how your deliverance comes. Sometimes that's the hardest thing for an actor or producer to do, but that's the mark of somebody who is just unflappable. And you'll write these things down and later be able to say, this isn't so bad. You know what was bad is that time I got fired down on that island off of Florida, and I had to go home and almost died in a plane crash. That was bad. And you start to build this confidence where nothing scares you anymore. And that's probably the biggest enemy of good work in this business, fear. 
it's a town that's run on fear, fear of losing your job, fear of being embarrassed. And if you can get past that fear and be fearless, confident, not un, you know, unfounded courage, but a really deep sense of confidence that, no, I'm, supposed to, I'm good at this. I'm good at what I do. And you know, if they don't hire me, they're nuts. Having that sort of confidence is life-changing for you, and it's impactful on others. Oh, John, that's so good. And I'm going to be coming back to that, I'm sure, at some point in the not-too-distant future. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, John, if you had only one movie to stake your entire career on, what kind of movie would it be and what talent would you want attached? Wow, that's a question. What movie would I be – would I want – if I had one to make? You know, I – um I just lo- I mean, all the hype, of course, today is Star Wars, which is opening. And so I think about here's a movie that just transcended uh, everything. It, 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 it was a, an amazing but unknown cast. It was a project that could have been given away to the studio, but the, the filmmaker, George Lucas, was so passionate about it. He, he held on to, just let me keep the merchandising, you know, and we made it kind of independently at a budget level that was not crazy. And now look at the result of the franchises, the shows, the characters, the books that have been written. I guess I, I really like the idea of a script like that, a story like that, that transports you to another time. And yet the issues are all very relevant to what we're going through, or at least what I was going through as a teenager at the time, wanting to conquer bigger worlds, to live for a cause greater than myself, uh, to be, to hear the call to action and, and, and to respond, uh, the, to, to really own your destiny and step into it, lean into it like Luke Skywalker, as terrifying as that may be to lose, every, you lose everything, and yet know that he's no fool who gives up that which he can never keep. For that which he can never lose and and that's kind of the kind of movie i want the kind of message i want and then gosh i love the idea of discovering a whole cast of uh unknowns like they did in star wars uh that are now just iconic right um i saw another movie that really i love this summer called rise of the guardians i think um it was amazing uh the chris pratt movie is that right is that the, do i have the title right i believe so yeah yeah I just thought well, this was really a fun adventure. I'd never heard much about the movie, and I liked all the characters. It took me and transported me into a new world, and there was a call to back. There was a call to action that was responded to. There was also a lot of good humor, a lot of good music. So I love those kind of uh, fantasy escape uh, adventure stories that also are relatable to me and my own uh, desire to lean into my destiny, um, as terrifying as that may be, and to own it. John, it sounds like you may be someone who reads a lot. Um, if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? I'm sorry, one book? You one book, book yes. Vanessa, could you say that one more time? Yes, yeah, sure. The question? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was just saying, it sounds like you're someone who reads a lot. Um, and so I'm wondering yeah. if there was maybe one book that you could recommend for our listeners that you believe would really help them in, you know, w- whether it be in their career or in their life. Career-wise. Well, um, first I'll give you my personal um, – well, when, when I was a young actor, I was reading about Vincent van Gogh called Lust for Life. And this was about an artist who was just frustrated at every turn. And, and um, I love the title Lust for Life because that's what I want in my work. That's what I want in my career. That's what I want in my relationships. I want to love deeper. I want to live sweeter. I want to risk more. I don't want to go you know, with regrets um, out of this life. I want to you know, burn bright. So a, a book like that's a personal favorite of mine. But, of course, as a Christian, I have to say, you know, the richest best-selling book of all time with truth in it is the Bible. And in, in the Bible, I love the book of Philippians, which talks about joy, because I think what's missing in this business and what people love and they want to bottle is that effusive joy. How do you capture that joy? And a, a great quote I read in a, another book that I also recommend called Wild at Heart there was a great quote in there that said, don't look around the world and ask what the world needs. And don't do that. Look within yourself and say, what makes me come alive? And do that because what the world desperately needs are people that are fully alive. And I thought, man, that, that makes sense is if you try and fake it or, or, or force it by saying, well, um, the world really needs more James Dean. 
type. So I'm going to become James Dean, but I'm not James Dean. I'm boy next door from Chicago, Illinois, and I need to be the best me I can be. And the best me I can be loves acting, you know, in a certain kind of role in a certain kind of uh, film. And I, if that's what makes me come alive, people are going to respond to that. So I need to find my passion, follow that passion, and not try and fake it or force it by trying to be something I'm not or somebody else I'm not. I need to be true to who I am and follow again that destiny. If I do that, people will respond to it. They'll respond to the work. They'll respond to my joy. So Philippians, wild at heart, lust for life, the Bible in general, um, those those would be a couple of uh, books high on my reading list. It's interesting. Wild at Heart is actually one of my favorite books, which is is uh, is atypical because it's actually a book um, that is written for men about the journey of what it means to uh, transition from being a boy to a man. But I, I just felt that it had so many general life applications that even for women, you know, it spoke very deeply to my soul. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, that fantastic book. Um, and Film Talk Nation, cool. I know that you love Orjo. So thank you for joining us today we've partnered with our friends over Audible to offer you a free audio book. Great titles available include, include Story by Robert McKee, Save the Cat Strikes Back by Blake Snyder, Why Not Me by Mindy Kaling, and Your Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. If you haven't already done so, you can claim your free audio book at audibletrial.com forward slash film talk. That's audibletrial.com forward slash film book. Uh, film talk, sorry. <laughs> and this link will also be included in today's show notes. Um, so, John, if you could recommend just one movie for our listeners, one movie that you feel uh, they are going to learn so much through, what would it be and why? Wow. Um, one movie that they would learn so much through. I guess um, a movie I discover, you know, everybody talks about their favorite film, and a lot of people mention It's a Wonderful Life. One of my favorite films is an obscure, more obscure, I should say, classic called Meet John Doe. And I just love this story because it's about a man who stands up. Um, he's, he's kind of cast, if you will, uh, out of obscurity uh, to become sort of a national celebrity. And uh, he, he writes a column in the paper. Um, somebody else writes it for him. So he's really a fake from the beginning to end. He's just cast to play this role of uh, somebody who says, I protest. And he, he's protesting everything wrong in the world. I love this journey. There's so much to learn about storytelling, about uh, great dialogue, about um, stand, uh, the power of one to stand up, and a man who kind of compromises and sacrifices what he knows to be the truth in order to get you know, a dollar and make a buck, and then at the end repents of it. I just think there's so many great life messages, so many great storytelling uh, lessons to be learned, so many great themes, that if I had to pick a movie that's really my favorite Christmas um, story, uh, Meet John Doe. And, you know, at the end of that movie, he basically protests and says, you know, on Christmas Eve, I'm going to jump off the Empire State Building. I'm sick and done with life. And I just think, wow, it's a powerful story about a man who's lost hope who refines it. And I think that's that's all of our journey. We are all going to lose hope at some point. But the question is not when does it happen, but how do you recover from that? How do you refine, re-hope, rediscover joy? And, you know, when you can do that and do it again and do it again and start to impart that to others, well, then you're a success, whether you're a working actor, uh, an established, famous producer, or whether you're complete and uh, total anonymous unknown, you are successful because you've been able to share hope, give um, encouragement and make a difference in somebody else's life. And, and that's really why I got into this business. And I think we all did to tell stories that will hopefully give hope, change people's lives and, and inspire them. So it's kind of cool to be uh, uh, in front of the camera doing that, behind the camera doing that, and then even off in the audience and doing that almost anonymously. That's, that's super cool too. John, I've not yet seen that movie, but it will definitely be added to my Netflix list by the end of the day. It sounds like a great movie. Um, is there maybe a website or an app that you find particularly useful in your line of work? Well, sure. There's a, uh, I'm primarily focused, of course, now on producing. So I'm going to give kudos and shout outs to a friend of mine who's a uh, line producer and I depend upon line producers basically to do budgets, to do schedules. They're so good at all the things that I'm not. Um, they're super organized, almost like military field commanders. They know how to take um, 
you know, take the hill and take charge and organize and delegate and run a battlefield. And some of my favorite lime producers um, are uh, Tim Moore, who runs Malpaso, just did Sully uh, for Clint Eastwood. He did Million Dollar Baby, Flags of Our Fathers. He's just a fantastic professional, super um, line producer. And um, there's another guy that I've worked with quite a bit named Stephen Marnaccio. And there's a website called lineproducing.com. And I just find that Stephen is somebody who really has made a science out of this crazy unscientific business because he's got all the forms, he's got all the tools, he's got all the shortcuts, the hacks, the way to um, help somebody make a great film, even if you've never uh, had much experience making a movie before. There, there, is, there are tools, there are templates, there is a science to it, and Stephen can be very helpful. And if you go to lineproducing.com, um, he'll give you some of his tips and everything from script to schedule to budget to other resources that he recommends for aspiring filmmakers and people trying to make a movie. That sounds like a fantastic resource. Um, John, it's time for the martini shot. What parting piece of guidance do you want to share with us? Gosh, I would say um, my my uh, final parting shot um, would be to um, do the work. Um, I think so many of us love to talk, 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 and I'm I'm one of them. I'm out here. I'm an actor. Love to hear myself talk, but at the end of the day, it's not what we say that counts. It's what we do, and it's about action. So I hope that what you've learned today will result in you not talking about it, but actually going out and what will you do today to take your dream closer to the goal? What will you actually translate into action? Will you do the work? Now, doing the work requires that you be fearless. That means you cannot stop and filter or, or stifle or um, edit yourself. Just like a really good actor, you have to become unselfconscious and get out of your head and out there doing it. And sometimes the biggest stumbling block to moving forward is just um, the analysis, the, the paralysis of analysis. We just sit there and think, overthink it. Go do it. If you're depressed, get out of your house. Go for a run. If you feel like I screwed that interview up, you, you've got to go, you can't dwell on the past. You've got to live in the moment, own it, move on. Life is short. This town has a short memory. How are you going to reinvent yourself? What can you do differently? But take a step, take an active step. Do something that translates into an activity that at the end of the day you can look and say, look, I wrote five pages. Look, I, I, I ran two miles. Look, I, I prayed, I meditated for an hour. I rested, I relaxed. Give yourself a goal and then set out to accomplish it. I think if we aim at nothing, we hit it every time. So pick a specific goal that you want to accomplish and then go do the work. What will you do today to get closer to your goal? I think that that's a great finishing point for this interview. Well, that's a wrap. Film Talk Nation, in this industry, you are only as good as the people you know. And today you've been hanging out with John Shepard and myself. If you want to go the extra mile, head over to filmtalkpodcast.com and type John Shepard into the search bar. The show notes from today's show will appear along with everything we discuss, like John's recommended book and movie. John, we appreciate you sharing your priceless insight with us today. Film Talk Nation thanks you and we'll see you on the red carpet thank you Vanessa